It's Tuesday. Let's talk waivers. Let's talk about all the players that you got to let your idiot league mates waste a bunch of fab on, waste their waiver spots on, waste all the good stuff on, okay? Because that's what we're doing every single Tuesday, so make sure you're subscribed to the channel. On my right, you will see a list of trending up players, a list of trending down players. So we're going to go through uh, the top ads this week as well as players that I think y'all can drop. You hate to see it, but it's part of the game. And that list on the right over there, the trending up is not you know, rankings or the top waiver wire pickups of the week or anything like that. What that is, is like the raw number of pickups. So a guy like Tyler Johnson was so unowned that the raw number of pickups that he had in, in all of these leagues is going to be a lot higher than a player was that was lesser owned. Okay. So I hope that makes sense. This is just raw pickups, not necessarily rankings for waiver wire. Okay. So let's get into it. And I want to start off with the players that you uh, would not be an idiot to make sure that you jumped your league mates on. And of course, we have to start off with the poster boy for this week, Isaiah Likely, the tight end for the Baltimore Ravens, who pops off for about a billion catches, eight catches, I think, or nine catches, 111 yards, and scores a touchdown at the detriment of Mark Andrews. This was all the way back on Thursday night against the Chiefs. So we've had some time to marinate on it. We've had some time to think on it. And here is what I will say for Isaiah Likely. I think this is more of a problem to Mark Andrews owners than it is uh, a surefire tight end replacement for people that end up picking up Isaiah Likely. Now, I will say for Likely, this is good and probably sticky going forward. The Ravens ran two tight end personnel on between 67 and 70% of their plays on Thursday night. So that's good because that means they are getting their best players onto the field, which means Likely is going to play a lot. However, he's still going to be second fiddle to Mark Andrews in the red zone and probably overall just for the rest of the season in terms of tight end targets. Mark Andrews was dealing with, you know, an injury from the car crash, a serious injury that ended his year last year. There might be a ramp up period for him. The other thing to take into consideration here is like Lamar's not going to throw that many passes. He's not going to drop back that many times. The Baltimore Ravens will not be in a game script like they were chasing the Chiefs on Thursday Night Football many times, you know, throughout the year. I believe they are underdogs in like maybe two games for the rest of the season, if that. So the passing volume will be down. Mark Andrews will probably play more and more. Um, but it was good to see Isaiah Likely on the field for 70% of the snaps overall. He's also a monster after the catch. He's one of the best movers with the ball in his hands at the position. So that gets you excited. I would say Likely is a target for people that had like a David Njoku who's dealing with a high ankle sprain, that had Jake Ferguson who has an MCL sprain, that ended up trying to go late round tight end, you know, like the Cole Komets or whatever. And now you don't have a tight end. I think Likely's going to be startable week to week. I think he'll probably catch, you know, between three and five passes a week. And I think that will net him low end tight end one numbers, but that's the way I'm looking at him. You know, he's probably in that like Goddard tier going forward. Obviously he's got insane upside. If something were to happen to Mark Andrews, you've already, already seen him operate as like a top five tight end in fantasy in each of the last couple seasons, as we've seen Andrews miss time, he's always really, 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 really good. So he's got standalone value. He's got handcuff value, which is something that you don't really see at the tight end position ever. Unless I'm really desperate at tight end, I'm not throwing more than like 15 or 20% of my fab budget on Isaiah Likely, especially if I'm not in a tight end premium league. If I'm in a league where tight ends get as much points as wide receivers or running backs for catching passes or if it's just like a standard half PPR league I'm much less enticed to throw a bunch of fab dollars on Isaiah Likely if it's tight end premium obviously you're feeling a lot better about it because now you could use a dude like Likely in your flex spot as a second tight end on your roster but overall I'm probably going to let someone else spend the money on Likely let someone else get real excited for week one and drop the entire bag on him because I think there are better values at tight end available that will be okay in terms of like producing for you rest of season. So I don't think like what we saw in week one is fluky, but it's definitely not predictive here. If I were a team that had one of those top tight ends, like I'm not, if I'm one of the teams that drafted, you know, a, a big six tight end, right? Whether it was Laporta, Kelsey, Kincaid, even Andrews, McBride, Kyle Pitts, like I'm not going overboard for likely because one of those guys flopped in week one you know we talked about this in the recap video yesterday week one of 2023 last year the tight end one was hunter henry with five catches for 56 yards and a touchdown these teams are getting off to slower and slower starts each year because they take the preseason less and less seriously each year and it shows in their passing offense so i'm not worried about the top tight ends i'm not blowing my budget on likely if i'm worried about one of the top tight ends that i drafted i would spend a little bit more 
on likely if I have one of the tight ends that's going to miss time or I completely whiffed on the tight end that I drafted. So in that case, I might bump the budget up to 22, 25%. But listen, there are going to be much better waiver wire weeks. Like last year, week one was Puka and it was Kyron and it was Gus Edwards. And every year there are guys that pop the fuck off and they're typically at the skill position. So I wouldn't go crazy right now on Isaiah Likely unless you feel like you're really desperate or you're in a tight end premium league. So we'll start off with that. We'll also just jump into J.K. Dobbins here because he's probably, for the most part, pretty highly owned in your league, but it would be a stupid video if we did not touch on the man who popped off 10 carries, 135 yards, and a touchdown, also caught three passes, only four yards, but good to see him involved in the passing game. He's obviously the passing down back with Gus Edwards there, who looks like a cone out there. J.K. Dobbins looked explosive as fuck. I think he had a 61-yard run and a 46-yard run. So you're talking about over 100 yards on just two carries. That looks like what the rushing offense is going to be. So huge first game for him. I'd imagine that he will continue to eat and eat and eat into the workload of the Chargers backfield like that's the good thing about Dobbins I think is his upside is is so high because this is not a situation where you know someone got hurt and then he stepped in and that and then we're worrying about like when that other guy comes back what's the backfield look like this this could be a situation like Kyron Williams where like you were unsure of the backfield to start and then a clear top end talent emerged to take the backfield overall so Dobbins ended up breaking out like obviously he needs to get his conditioning in order Uh, I don't know how he has come back from both an Achilles and an ACL tear over the last two years but it looks like he is back and this is going to be a very effective Chargers running offense behind like a really really strong offensive line so with Dobbins playing in passing role with Dobbins looking explosive again he keeps getting caught from behind I don't know if that's just who he is now he doesn't have that like top end finish the run kind of thing but like if he's busting off 40 yard run 60 yard runs those will eventually turn into touchdowns so Dobbins is obviously a super priority ad if he's on your way waiver wire I would prioritize him over Isaiah likely and Dobbins is the dude that I would drop a significant portion of my fab on you know in the 30 to 40 you know ish range if you have uh, a need at the running back position let's start moving our way down the trending list on the left side here we've got Jordan Mason who obviously filled in for C-Mac last night C-Mac was a last minute inactive which was a huge surprise obviously to the entire world and the fantasy community apparently Adam Schefter said that he's unlikely to play week two versus Minnesota this this is a weird situation vibes are weird so I would just say like Jordan Mason for sure obviously needs to be owned and if he's available on your waiver wire like he's a top five running back as long as Christian McCaffrey is out. So Christian McCaffrey is back. He probably becomes relatively irrelevant in that backfield. Um, But for now, if you get another start, if you get another two, three starts out of Jordan Mason, like those are almost starts that are good enough to win you weeks. I think he popped off like 150 total yards last night, a touchdown, super involved. That offensive line looks strong as shit. So they were opening up holes uh, and that will open up holes in your opponent if you've got Jordan Mason in your lineups. Jordan Mason is a dude that, of course, if he's available, you know, you're dropping 10, 12, 15% on him uh, because he obviously has handcuff value throughout the remainder of the season. With Tyler Johnson, we can kind of talk about this entire Rams receiving group because Puka is obviously on the IR. Cooper Cup will be the GOAT for the time being next month, next six weeks, however long Puka misses. Behind him, you've got Demarcus Robinson, who ran the second most routes on the team behind Cooper Cup. Then you've got Tyler Johnson. I don't know if y'all remember Tyler Johnson from his Minnesota days. He was an elite college producer opposite Rashad Bateman back in the day, but he never really got never really got a cooking in Tampa Bay. So Tyler Johnson, Demarcus Robinson are both really interesting with Puka Nakua out. D Rob will be the wide receiver too. And we saw him have, you know, four or five straight games last year pretty high level production. So I think Tyler Johnson probably offers a little bit more upside. He's a little bit more exciting, but he's also probably got a lower floor on a week to week basis. He did best Demarcus Robinson in terms of targets per route run, but in terms of snap share, as you could see, he was only at 65%. He did take a slant for like 63 yards in this game so his his stats got boosted by that one big play but Robinson should be a more consistent piece of this offense so I would prioritize D-Rob over Tyler Johnson D-Rob would probably get somewhere in like the seven to ten percent range for me Tyler Johnson is probably more of a dart throw in the three to five percent see how that wide receiver room shakes out and then you want to talk about tight ends that could fill in if you miss dudes Colby Parkinson was my stream of the week in our uh rankings video last week which will go live every Wednesday so make sure you subscribe to the channel for that Kobe Parkinson ran 80 percent of the routes in this offense he actually ran the single most routes among the tight end position in week one he only went four for 47 
but that somehow ended up being good enough for tight end seven on the week. So Colby Parkinson got a lot of targets relative to the tight end position overall in week one, and he is probably going to be relatively free on your waiver wire. And with Puka out, obviously the targets need to be distributed elsewhere. So that's kind of the way I'm looking at the Rams distribution for targets right now. And in terms of like fab, Colby Parkinson's still just like a one to 2% fab bid. Alan Lazard, yeah, we ain't doing all that. There are some other like interesting running backs that I think need to be talked about. They're basically the RB2 in their backfield. And I know I've seen like Jaleel McLaughlin available on some people's waiver wires. For me, this despite how Denver looked, uh, he's a clear like top running back ad. He bettered Javonta Williams in carries and targets and snaps he played way more saw five receptions uh, obviously they didn't amount to anything but like the usage is, is super super there so Jaleel McLaughlin if you're in a PPR league needs to be a priority ad as well then when we start looking at these backup running backs we got Alexander Madison who what intrigues me about him is he's playing basically every passing down snap he outsnapped Zamir White because they were trailing which might be the case for a lot of the Las Vegas snaps uh he caught a lot of passes he took one to the cribbo for like a 35 yard touchdown uh, he's obviously going to split a little bit of the rushing work. Most of that will be Zamir, but Alexander Madison will be involved. He's taking all the two and four minute drill snaps. He's taking all the third and long snaps, all the passing situation snaps. And if you're in a PPR league, like Madison should absolutely uh, be owned. And I could see him eating more and more into the workload of Zamir White. And if Zamir White misses time and we've never seen him hold up for, you know, a full season or anything like that, then Madison would become probably like a top 20 play at running back. Justice Hill, I have way less confidence in and I'm like super super off him I'm not really putting any money down on Hill because again the Ravens will not have game script like they did against the Chiefs he just has such a low floor and a low ceiling like there's nothing enticing about Justice Hill in my opinion like next week if he got three fantasy points wouldn't be surprised but I don't ever really see him going over 10 fantasy points so I don't know why we're I don't know why we're even talking about Justice Hill probably just because it was a prime time game but Tank Bigsby does intrigue me a little bit Tank Bigsby ran really really well Next to Travis Etienne, he went 12 for 73. So you're talking about over six yards per carry. Only saw 32% of the snaps, but he saw as many carries as Travis Etienne did. They both had 12 carries. Travis Etienne fumbled on the goal line. Tank Bigsby was talked up a lot this offseason. They were talking about how they wanted to get him more involved. I think that was the case. Like You don't use a third-round pick on a player, especially a running back, if you don't have a plan to use him in a rotation. And we've had Doug Peterson always use rotation. I think Tank was just so bad last year that they were forced not to. But it's clear that if Tank plays this way, he's going to force a rotation. He will be a really, really high-end running back if anything happens to Travis Etienne, who's dealt with injuries since coming into the NFL. So Tank needs to be owned. I don't think he's going to be startable within the next couple of weeks. Like maybe he rips you off a couple like 40, 50 yard games, maybe scores a touchdown every third game or so, every fourth game or so, and you can get lucky on that. But he's someone that needs to be held because he's a pretty good runner. He just was incredibly bad on his targets last year and in the receiving game. And that's where Travis Etienne kind of excels. So I don't imagine him taking that role, but Tank for sure needs to be owned. I also just want to plug this in. We have our waiver wire rankings on our site going live within the next couple of hours. Uh, if you are a Big Dog member, a BG Big Dog member, you get the waiver wire rankings. So we have all of these players ranked. We have the exact fab suggestion for everyone within our rankings. We have the flex rankings, then we have positional rankings broken down, the fab suggestion, and then a little bit of a write-up for each player on there. So if you're a Big Dog member, that will go live soon. If you're not, you can go sign up on bdge.com. CO. Our rankings for week two overall, not just waiver wire, but like sit start rankings will also go live later today, I believe at 6 p.m. Eastern time. So if you want to get an early look at that, again, bdge.co. But the cheapest way to get it rather than paying a monthly membership fee for it is by going to underdogfantasy.com or just downloading the underdog fantasy app using code BDGE when you deposit just 10 bucks. You deposit just ten dollars not only are you getting the big dog membership free for the rest of the season so all of these rankings for every single week through the remainder of fantasy season but you'll get a free square for thursday night football so half a passing yard for tua and you'll get a deposit bonus when you do get on the app all right so those Three things are coming right to your face hole if you go download the Underdog Fantasy app and use promo code BDGE when you deposit $10 or more. Get our waiver wire rankings on the site. So as we continue down the list, we've got a few quarterbacks. Let's actually just run through the quarterback position real quick. Malik Willis is the top ad because Jordan Love is going to miss a few weeks with an MCL sprain. Malik Willis just has not shown that he could throw the fucking ball, man. I I get it if you're in a super flex league and you feel desperate, like he's got some rushing ability, but he's not someone that I'm spending really any fab on. And you're, you're definitely not starting him in a one quarterback league. He's a super flex desperation play at best. The rest of these guys, as you can see, are clearly 
like very owned. If Geno Smith is a waiver wire ad, I'd look for him. Justin Fields is probably super highly owned, uh, but he's obviously a streamer against a bad Denver defense and Fields' is rushing upside is crazy. And the last one I would throw on here, that's probably relatively highly owned as well, but Baker Mayfield obviously scorched Washington last week, four touchdowns, almost 300 uh, yards through the air, plays against Detroit, which is pretty much a run funnel defense at this point. And they're playing in the dome. This is a 51 point over under. So Baker is a great streaming option this week. We head back to the running back position. I'm not really interested in anyone else on this list outside of Bucky Irving. Okay, so Bucky Irving is a dude that I think has looked great. I will say there's warnings, there's pros and there's cons here. Rashad White continues to just be a really bad runner of the football. He can't run between the tackles. They play Detroit this week, so he's probably going to look really bad again running between the tackles. Bucky Irving, on the other hand, looked really good running between the tackles. He went nine for 62, nearly seven yards per carry. Most of that came in the fourth quarter. It was against Washington, uh, who actually has a pretty good run defense. But fourth quarter, like while they're up by about a bazillion points, so I'm not really you know, looking at the stats and thinking that's anything great, but Bucky's a pretty good in between the tackles runner. And it's a clear two man backfield here. It's just them two. So Bucky, I could see being more and more involved. The only problem is Rashad's so good in the passing game. And that's where Bucky's also really good. I don't see him ever really getting into that side of the game where the upside is unless Rashad White gets hurt. But Bucky also needs to be highly owned. And I would go as far as saying, I think I would rather roster Bucky than Alexander Madison, Justice Hill for sure. Bucky and Tank are really close. I think I would ultimately actually rather roster Bucky Irving, which might be a lesser popular opinion, but I would throw about 5% fab on Bucky right now to, to pick him up. And Zach Charbonnet is the last one down here. Charbonnet, I would just keep an eye out for. He's probably owned for the most part, but Kenneth Walker's dealing with an abdomen injury that doesn't seem to be too serious. Let's move back over to the wide receivers. Uh, Alec Pierce is super interesting because his pairing with Anthony Richardson, like Alec Pierce is good at running downfield routes and catching deep passes and that's about all he's good for but Anthony Richardson I don't want to say that's all he's good for in the passing game but that's a very very big part of his passing game I love A.D. Mitchell I think A.D. Mitchell could have had a monster breakout game this week if A. Rich didn't overthrow him twice probably on two touchdowns but it happened and Alec Pierce was the one that capitalized I think he went three for 125 through the air which is insane caught a touchdown Josh Downs he hasn't practiced at all so I'm honestly not expecting him to play in week two and I think when Downs is back, there's a better chance that A.D. Mitchell starts to get siphoned off in snaps, at least in the immediate future, over Alec Pierce, because Alec Pierce has been playing more snaps than A.D. Mitchell for the time being. So I think you could do worse, but he's a really low floor, high ceiling player. Devon Vele, uh, the rookie random 26-year-old for Denver. We could just kind of talk about the entire Denver wide receiver group actually all together. You have Vele, who caught eight passes for like 45 yards. Not, none of his passes were valuable. Uh, Bo Nix also attempted a lot of passes. It led to Vele having eight targets or eight catches. I think Josh Reynolds had seven or eight catches. Cortland Sutton did the same. They all had a bunch of targets. Cortland Sutton led the team with 12 targets. They were all peppered all over the place, but literally Vele led the team, despite all them seeing those many targets, with 45 yards. So nothing was past the line of scrimmage. Nothing was more than five yards down the field. It's not an offense I'm really looking to invest in. If you're in a deeper league, I'm fine with picking up Josh Reynolds. I'm fine with picking up Devon Vele. Vele is an interesting dude. He's like 6'4", 205 pounds, really athletic profile. Uh, I think Reynolds is probably a better possession receiver right now. But I, I think I'd be okay taking you know lesser shots on both of those dudes. Greg Dortch, we got to talk about him. Dortch the GOAT out here in Arizona getting fucking yell married. Uh, to win the game over here, six catches, 47 yards on eight targets, 61% of the snaps. He is clearly a slot only player like Michael Wilson and, and MHJ are playing 100% of the snaps on the outside for the Arizona Cardinals. But Dorch is clearly getting targeted all over the place. Something looked a little off with the Cardinals passing offense still. Uh, and I think it's going to take a second to mesh, obviously. Traveling to Buffalo week one is a really tough environment to play in. Um, but the, the the reports all offseason were that Greg Dortch was fucking lighting up training camp. And that just kind of continued into him being one of Kyler's favorite targets right into week one. So I think you could do worse than Dortch as, you know, a PPR scam going forward. He's kind of like Wondell Robinson where I don't know what the ceiling really is, but like he'll put you up 9, 10 PPR points if you're really desperate. <sighs> no one else down here is really unowned or I'm interested in. Jalen Naylor, I guess you could bring up. He had a really strong preseason and Jordan Addison aggravated his other ankle. So now he's dealing with two ankle injuries. But the 
Vikings have a really tough schedule going forward over the next month. They have the 49ers, then the Texans, then the Packers, then the Jets, and then a bye. So by that time, I mean, Jordan Addison should be back on the field and Naylor, it's not like you're starting Naylor against the fucking Niners next week. Tight ends, we've got really nothing here. I don't know how there's no no one else on the trending tab, but Colby Parkinson I already talked about. The other two I want to bring up that I think are really important. One, Tucker Craft, the Green Bay tight end. He outplayed Luke Musgrave on a heavy scale. He played 80% of the snaps while Luke Musgrave was down at 20%. I don't know if there was some kind of injury that happened that we didn't know about, but I thought Tucker Kraft was the one that was injured. Turns out that's not the case. His box score only amounted to two for 37, but he's he's clearly playing far over Luke Musgrave right now. The unfortunate part is now, obviously, Malik Willis is the quarterback, so you know they're going to pass the ball for 150 yards a game going forward, so he doesn't really have much going for him. But I think he's a really solid stash in deeper leagues where you need tight end help. And then the other one I would look at would be Luke Schoonmaker in Dallas because Jake Ferguson is probably going to miss the next two, three, four, five weeks. Dallas is an offense that always utilizes their tight ends to a high degree. So Luke Schoonmaker is a very good athlete. Uh, I think he is another one that like, if I'm not spending up for likely, like if I'm letting someone else drop 30, 35% of their fab on likely, I'm cool dropping a dollar or two on Colby Parkinson or Luke, Luke Schoonmaker and just kind of hoping I get a five for 50 game out of one of those guys. And then in terms of streaming defenses, again, I've got my template for y'all that led us to talking about like Chicago and teams like that last week. You look for teams that are home and you look for teams that are favored to win their game. The bigger the spread, the better the streaming option they are. And, you know, being at home, being against a rookie quarterback, being against a turnover worthy quarterback is a tiebreaker for you. So I look at the Chargers. They're definitely one of, if not the stream of the week here, coming off of a 15 point fantasy game last week against the Raiders. They now are six and a half point favorites against the Carolina Panthers. Washington, yeah, there's just not a fucking chance in hell I'm ever streaming a Washington team. I don't care that they're playing against the Giants. You have Jacksonville. I believe they are three point favorites against Cleveland at home. So that's that kind of hits the formula. They're also playing against Deshaun Watson, so that's a, a pretty nice tiebreaker. Indianapolis is a good stream against uh, Malik Willis and the Packers. Steelers are not available anywhere. The Seahawks are a pretty good stream, I think. Uh, this is a really low scoring over under. I think it's like 38 and a half or something like that. I think they're three and a half point favorites. They are away, though. They do have to travel all the way from Seattle to Foxborough, and New England's coming off a win. So I don't know that I love that. Uh, Los Angeles would definitely be my team of the week. And let's quit quickly get into uh, the players that are trending down here. I will go through the list really quickly and I will just say whether or not I'd be holding on to them for one or two more weeks or I'm okay to drop them for a better option. Blake Quorum, I'm holding on. Cole Komet, droppable. Jalen Polk, droppable. Uh, Yoshivas, I am holding on. Darnell Mooney, droppable. Dalvin Cook, what the fuck, droppable. Khalil Herbert, droppable. Caleb, hold on. Deshaun Watson, droppable. Rico Dowdle, I would hold on another week. A.D. Mitchell, I would hold on. Gus Edwards, I would hold on to. Kirk, droppable. Trey Benson, I would be okay dropping him, given the fact that there are other running backs like Amari DeMarcado taking the passing work. So I don't even know what kind of role he really has if James Conner were to get hurt. So I'm okay dropping him. Taysom Hill, I'd hold on to. Algier, I'd hold on to. Like, why would you drop? What were you expecting out of Algier? He's just the handcuff for Bijan. Kate Otten, droppable. Deontay Johnson, uh, no, I wouldn't drop him. Marvin Mims, for sure, droppable. Rome, we're not dropping. Dobbs, hold on to. Luke Musgrave, droppable. Sutton, don't drop. JSN, don't drop. Marshawn Lloyd, don't drop. Dontavian Wicks, don't drop. Jalen Tolbert, droppable. Luke McCaffrey, I would hold on to. Johnu Smith, droppable. Jordan Addison, definitely don't drop. Jake Ferguson, don't drop. Will Levis, droppable. Curtis Samuel, do not drop. Gibson droppable, Conklin droppable, Damian Pierce droppable, Javante do not drop, Burton droppable, Jalen Warren do not drop, Braylon Allen I'd hold on to for another week or two. Or if you're, I mean, you're really only holding on to Braylon Allen if you're a Brees Hall owner, in my humble ass opinion. Ben Sinat droppable for sure. Rodgers I would hold on to. Singletary definitely hold on to. Fields hold on to. Kamani Vidal I'm going to hold on to for one more week. I know he was a healthy scratch, but I want to see if they... If they healthy, scratch him again, definitely, obviously, drop him. Uh, Julian McLaughlin, definitely do not drop. All right, so there you have it. Week two, waiver wire. Guys to let your idiot league mates pick up. Guys that you got to pick up before your idiot league mates, however you want to phrase the damn thing. Again, our waiver wire rankings are available for you right now on bdge.co if you're a big dog member. And if you're not and you haven't deposited yet on Underdog Fantasy, that is the cheapest way to get access to the Big Dog membership. Underdog Fantasy app. 
promo code BDGE when you deposit $10 or more. That'll get you access for the year. All right. I'm out of here. I love you. Smokies.